Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, this is Orphan Last, aka Skylar Madison, and welcome to the Subscriber Drawing Request series, where you guys can ask me to draw a picture, and I might very well draw it for you. Which I think is a unique thing about my channel. You might be able to get me to draw something that you want me to draw. Basically, how this series works is you guys go ahead and supply me suggestions. You can supply me suggestions at any time, either on Twitter or in any of the subscriber drawing request videos. And then I go ahead and sift through the ideas that you guys have that you want me to draw. I go ahead and sift through them and I pick out my four or five favorites. And then... I go ahead and submit those onto a poll on Twitter. My username Twitter account is on the screen right now, so if you guys would like to participate in the polls that help decide which drawing suggestion will be drawn, you guys can actually vote on it as long as you follow me on Twitter. It's on the screen right now. However, just a little bit of a word on things that I will not draw. I will not draw copywritten material. There's too many issues where people get copyright strikes just for no reason whatsoever. And I don't really want to even go there. Next, I won't really want to draw things that are like family photographs or stuff like that. That doesn't interest me very much. Also, if you want to give me a drawing request that's just out of this world bizarre, I probably won't draw it just simply because I don't draw with my sense of humor. I, that's not the reason why I draw. And ultimately, I'm the one sifting through the drawing suggestions and deciding what will wind up inside of the poll. So, if you want your drawing suggestion to show up inside of the poll, feel free to leave a suggestion right now that follows that criteria. And let's get into this video. Let's talk about it. Now, I've actually made a heck of a lot of progress in working with this sci-fi warrior mouse image. And this is actually the first time that I've ever really tried to shade an image digitally. And it's actually been a really long time since I actually last shaded anything in general. And for some reason, I, I just stopped doing a lot of shading even with my pencil and paper drawings. And I think that some of the reason being is because I just wound up finding that things just started to not look natural whenever I tried to do that with pencil and paper. And the irritating thing about shading things with pencil and paper is that if you screw up, there's no going back. Whereas with digital media, if you screw up, there is a lot of going back. In fact, there's an indefinite amount that you can keep going back in order to help you refine the image the way that you want. Digital media is extremely forgiving. I love that about digital media. So I, I couldn't be happier with the results of this week's work on the Sci-Fi Warrior Mouse. Now, the first things that I wind up applying to the image is just kind of like midway between the darkest dark and midway between the brightest bright. The initial gray that I applied to the mouse at the very tail end of the last video in the subscriber drawing request series where I, I've been working on this exact same image, that gray is somewhere in the middle in between the brightest bright. And so the first value of gray that I applied in this video was kind of midway in between that and the darkest dark. And, you know, I wound up using a variety of different brushes, and I think that some of the brushes I'm never going to use for this particular workflow ever again. And I'm just going to go ahead and talk about uh, what it is that I used for this video a little bit, okay? So, of course, you know, one of my favorite smudge brushes is the Blender Rake. Now, it's not very often I use the Blender Rake brush, but when I do use it, it usually makes things look really good. You have to know when to use it. And I only used it a little bit inside of this video, but even still, when I used it, it wound up making things look really nice. Also, I wound up using the Shape Fill brush every once in a while. I especially used it a lot in the previous video, to be honest. But every once in a while, I wind up using that quite a bit, actually. 
it actually makes a very useful eraser. And you can actually make any brush into an eraser just by pressing E on the keyboard. It makes it so that you don't necessarily have to go back and forth a million times with your stylus. You can just get it done really quick. Whenever I applied light inside of this video, I wound up using the uh, Adjust Overlay Burn brush, or I just wound up using just a soft airbrush. I, I kind of experimented with a variety of different types of brushes. Uh, the one that I initially was using quite a bit was the Chalk Soft brush. And there's a lot of things that I really liked about this brush, but you have limitations to how much you can shade with it. Now, I think looking back, I might actually... Like, if I were to try using this brush again, I would wind up adjusting the pressure to opacity to it. Either that, or making it so that when you press lightly on the stylus, you get a light value than the value that you have selected. I think you just go to your brush settings, and you go to Source and Darken. And you're, you're able to kind of change the value of your brush that way. You can actually adjust the curve on it. And I think that might actually be useful. But I haven't really seen any results with that. Uh, but, you know, I'm just experimenting with the brush settings right now. Now that it's a little bit more convenient to do so. I mean, the interface is a little bit more friendly. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I know everything about it. But ultimately, what I found to be the most useful useful tools in shading was actually some brushes made by David Raveau. Now with Krita 4.0, I believe that these brushes came with Krita 4.0. Okay, so specifically I wound up using the Divod 1D1 charcoal pencil thin. You can also use the uh, charcoal pencil medium or the charcoal pencil large ultimately they're all pretty much the same thing one thing that is kind of interesting is when you make the brush really big it kind of does look like when you hold a pencil and you hold it to the side and you're just shading with the side of the pencil it gives it a very different look it's like having a million little dots on the screen and it has a nice looking texture to it. And then as you narrow down your brush more and more, you can refine even more. You can make it look more refined and not just look like a series of dots or, or make it look like the entire image was drawn with the side of a pencil. I really like these Devod 1D1 charcoal pencils. These are actually very very good. And like I said, I do believe that David Raveau made those brushes and big props to him because these are excellent, excellent brushes. And a brush that I used pretty sparingly was also the Blender Blur brush. And this is for blending and such. Now you want to be really sparing on how much blending you do with any type of blending brush. And the reason why is because it is a texture killer. So, like I said, I was using a brush that simulates a pencil or a chalk or something along those lines quite a bit throughout this video. And so you pull out the blender brush and you start kind of smoothing things out, it just kills all of the texture. So you want to make sure that you're only blending the things that need blending. And then once you're done, what I would suggest is kind of really super lightly apply a texture back onto it, just super lightly with a normal brush, such as a brush that simulates uh, charcoal or something along those lines, or chalk. Whatever brush, whatever texture that you're wanting, just go ahead and apply that lightly on a different layer or something. Uh, even with a big brush or something, just make the brush really big and, and just really lightly just brush over what you blended and then go ahead and erase all of the excess after that. Now, initially when I started to apply uh, the different values, the darker values and the lighter values, it was really gradual and such like that. It didn't really look very good and I just kind of crossed my fingers and thought, well, I, I really hope that this works because this, this image kind of sucks at the moment. And then, you know, I went darker and lighter and darker and lighter and eventually the picture really started to come together. So if you're expecting immediate results when you're working with gradients, don't. Now, 
the type of workflow that I worked with was somewhat similar to you buying some of those really super professional pencils where the lead has different hardness and the lead of variously different pencils have different values of darkness as well. So it's like pulling out a pencil that's really hard and somewhat light and then going ahead and shading with that first and then pulling out a, a, another pencil with softer lead that's darker and then going ahead and shading with that and going with another pencil that's even softer and darker and then shading with that and progressively going more and more light and more and more dark if that makes sense and of course you know everything to me it just seems like it's it's starting to pop quite a bit now i did a lot of rim lighting to the warrior mouse and the snake and the reason for that is because the light source is behind them and also because the warrior mouse happens to be holding a gun and he's shooting he's shooting at the snake and so you know, it's to be expected that there's going to be a lot of light there, either from a muzzle flash or because it happens to be a laser gun. And in this case, I decided it was going to be a laser gun. And so it all fell into place pretty well and all that good stuff. Now, there does come a point inside of this video where you see me kind of really speed up the video and it's when I'm working with the snake. There came a point where I actually got the snake nearly finished. And I had a lot of problems this week where my computer just got so slow. Even It didn't matter how big or small my brush was or how big or small my brush stroke was. It just seemed like if I made a brush stroke, all of a sudden I'd be waiting five minutes for the computer to render it. So I wound up having to close the computer restart it and everything turn it back on again and it got really really frustrating for me so i wound up trying to save the image and closing it down now i did this about four or five times one of these times when i was working on the snake it didn't save the image now what really frustrates me about krita this week is just that i opened up the image and it said there's a auto save with more progress or something and it says do you want to open it and at that point i'm thinking well let me take a look at the image first because i i saved the image i remember saving the image i waited five minutes for krita to save the image and then it opened it and it opened at a previous state and at that point i'm thinking oh yeah let's open up that save state problem is krita just went ahead and auto saved immediately and uh, so the auto save got overwritten and so I had to actually redo 90% of the snake all over again. I did the snake twice and that was really frustrating. A lot of times whenever I get into that state, it makes me just want to quit for the entire day. But I really wanted to show you guys some good progress. So, you know, I bit the bullet. I sat down and forced myself to continue working. And so I, I eventually got the snake really polished and all that good stuff now when working with the values and such like that you know if you wind up picking values that are just too high contrast or not enough contrast or something along those lines you can just use the curves okay it's a filter the filter curves and you could just kind of do an inverted s curve or something along those lines if you have too much contrast with the values of dark and light that you've been working with or you can go ahead and just do an s curve subtle or a little bit more dramatic it doesn't matter in order to ramp up the contrast and you can access i believe i believe you can access the curves by pressing control m on the keyboard uh, or you can just go into the filters menu and find it there but you know, keyboard shortcuts are, are called shortcuts for a reason. It's because they are shortcuts. They make things faster. Now, I don't know if there's any, like, true method in order to make sure that the darkest darks are in the right place and such like that. But the thing is, is that your brain is not a computer. It's not running on binary or anything like that. You are a human being and the whole point of shading an image with grayscale and such like that and the whole point of artwork as I've stated previously in the past is to communicate 
the way that your brain perceives reality, whether or not it happens to be accurate or not. Now, there are official tools, especially inside of perspective, to help you measure things out and such, and you can use those as strictly or not as strictly as you want. But the thing is, is that with shading and such like that, I guess you can, to some extent, be able to determine where a shadow is going to be, but the darkest part of that shadow and such, that's all up to you. Even with a box or something, there's slight imperfections to the straightness of the box, for example. And so, you know, the light as it cascades on the variously different surfaces of a box, it's going to have some variation. It's not going to be this strict gradient. Now, inside of Photoshop and such like that, you'll see people just apply a gradient to a box just as a shortcut. And you know what? That's fine. You know, you don't have to have things exactly perfect and such. Now, what you just saw me do with the teeth there is basically I press Control U and I went ahead and changed the darkness value to it. And it just seemed like they were just a little bit too dark of a gray and such. And, you know, even though your teeth are white, or at least you always hope they are, white can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. For example, context is key, okay? That's the thing with all colors and all values and such like that. When you walk into a theater, okay, when you go to the movie theater to watch, say, Infinity War or whatever it is, you walk in, you see this big white screen, okay? Now, what happens is there's a projector that shines a bright light onto that white screen. And that light coming from that projector is so bright that the default whiteness of that screen becomes the black during the movie. I'm not joking. That's what it is. So context is important to keep in mind whenever you're messing around with color. So even though something may be white, as its default value or super bright colored or something, if it's shrouded in shadow or something along those lines, even though its default, you know, value and color is going to be bright or something along those lines, if it's shrouded in darkness, it, all it means is it's going to be brighter than the colors surrounding it. That's it. That's all it is. That's all it means. So that's what I did with the teeth. Now, you saw me kind of play with the curves and kind of desaturate the contrasts of the values on this hand. I kind of regret that because there's so much of the values that are kind of malleable as you approach the final stage. You just need to be careful about what it is you have on different layers. Now, for me, in the end, I have the warrior mouse on its own layer. I have the snake on its own layer. The background on its own layer. I have the ground as its own layer and such like that. And here I went ahead and wrote, wow, I made that. Because really, I, I was genuinely surprised about it. Now, I, I would have been able to see my progress a lot easier if I was able to zoom out uh, more consistently. Now, I do make sure to zoom out fairly frequently and then zoom back in, but sometimes the gravity of just how good the progress is is kind of a mystery to me along the way a little bit. And the reason for that is because the best performance for my computer with Krita seems to be being zoomed in. Not necessarily as zoomed in as you see me right now, uh, right now I'm making a selection, and selections need to be perfect. Now, eventually I kind of give up on this approach on making this particular selection. Uh, I still use this selection, but not for the entire image. Uh, but anyways, like, uh, whenever I seem to zoom out, it seems like credit's performance tends to slow down quite significantly. So oftentimes I wind up just doing my own thing and kind of zoom in to where I get the performance that I'm looking for out of Krita and my computer. So here you kind of see me isolate the line work for the warrior mouse. And then I make sure that there's no part where there's an opening. Now, there was two little openings, but in the end, you know, I, I made sure to kind of avoid those. And that allowed me to be able to get rid of all of the stuff on the exterior. Because 
while I was drawing the values and such for the warrior mouse, even, especially with the snake actually, uh, I wound up not really caring if I was inside the lines. And here you see me isolate the snake and I go ahead and close up any of the openings so that I could do that same approach. I could just isolate the snake later on down the road, make the selection, and then get rid of all the values and lines that are outside of the lines and so that I could keep things nice and clean after the fact and such like that. Now I'm kind of irritated with how I initially approached making the snake. Now what I was doing was I was using the color picker and just picking up the values from the mouse and then kind of lightening up the value of that particular swatch, I guess. The value that I wound up picking up. Because the snake is a little bit further away in the stacking order, a further distance away from the actual camera. And so typically when objects are further away from the camera, they tend to kind of lighten up a little bit in terms of value. Even though the snake's not too far away, it would have a little bit of a lighter value. The reason why this kind of frustrates me is because I just don't feel as if it wound up matching in the scene quite as well. I think that trying to get some of those value shifts especially when characters are still kind of rudimentarily close to each other, you should start kind of making those sort of decisions after the image is near complete. Uh, now, I could be wrong. Maybe this is just a fluke, and maybe this is just a case-by-case -case sort of basis. And maybe in most 99% of the situations that you might encounter, you want to deal with these sorts of value shifts early on, but at least with what I experienced, uh, later on I wind up applying a gradient map, okay? And the gradient map is applied like a layer mask fr from like Photoshop. It's kind of similar to that, and it's actually faster to do the gradient map that way than to apply the gradient map with destructive editing. So that's what I went ahead and did. And by the way, there is some horrible advice out there on YouTube. Uh, I forgot who made the video, but the person said, Well, when you want to go ahead and apply a gradient map, you actually want to make the image really, really small, uh, just almost the size of a thumbnail, and then you want to apply the gradient map onto that, and then you want to blow it up real big. No, you don't want to do that. That sounds like a horrible idea to get noise all over your image, regardless of if you wind up applying it as a blending mode on your original artwork or not. It, no, you don't, you never want to apply a gradient map onto a tiny image and then make the image really big uh, by using the transformation tool. No, don't do that. Don't ever do that. That's a stupid idea. But anyways, I kind of lost train of my thought, but my thought process, but here <clears throat> you kind of see me start to kind of shade the snake. You saw me pull out the reference image and I used it as a reference and there did come a point where I realized okay this has been very useful using it as a reference for the values and such but the lighting inside of the drawing is different than the lighting inside of my scene and I started to kind of think to myself okay well I'm kind of uh, frustrating myself at this point. I just need to get rid of the reference image. Now, every once in a while you'll see me pull up my Wacom uh, tools and I try to open up different things, try to mess around with things. Whenever I do that, for some reason, Krita is just processing things so damn slowly that eventually it affects my graphics tablet. Now, I really hope that there's some sort of a driver update really soon for my Wacom Intuos Art uh, graphics tablet because this is starting to get ridiculous. There are times where the computer starts to lag out so much that some of the hotkeys on the tablet itself stop working and even the stylus buttons stop working and then I have to start using the sliders that are happen to be uh, on the sides of the screen and um, you know the zoom in slider in the bottom right hand corner of the screen which slows me down not just because crit is slow but also because you know zooming in and out and such 
without using the actual buttons that I need in order to do it. Uh, just frust it's, it's frustrating. It's, it's all frustrating. I just wish that things could work out better. And all of this that you're seeing on the screen right now is at a thousand times speed. And the reason being is because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I lost all of this. All of this was just poof, gone in an instant because it started to affect my graphics tablet. I had to restart my computer and I saved my progress. I don't, I don't care what Krita says. I saved my progress. And then, oh yeah, you know, do you want to open up an autosave? Well, you know, let me take a look at the image first to decide. Seriously, like how, how about you show me, Krita, Krita, why don't you show me a display, like, you know, a medium-sized thumbnail that takes up about half the screen of both the save file that I'm just going to open right now and the autosave version. That way I can actually decide whether or not I want to open the autosave or not. It's just so frustrating to be like, I don't know if I want to open the autosave or not. Evidently, there might be a problem. And then if there is a problem, then there's this immediate autosave that saves progress lost on your autosave file. So you can't go back to your autosave file, which completely defeats the whole purpose of having an autosave file. And then if you open up the autosave file and it's basically erased progress, which has happened to me before, then it autosaves and gets rid of your original file. Or at least every time you try to open up the normal file without a, the autosave, it seems to open the autosave every single time. This is frustrating about Krita. This needs to be fixed. The current layout of the autosave feature really pisses me off. Uh, this needs to be fixed. And I don't mean to be really angry towards the developers, but seriously, the devel you developers, please, I lost work. I lost, it was probably about an hour. I lost about an hour. Now, here what you see me doing in my second approach in making the the snake is I, I start using the spline. And I, I'm, I wind up being fairly accurate with the, with the spline. I'm not too worried about the perfect perspective or anything like that. I just want the general effect. Now, the thing is, is that uh, there was, I think I might have mentioned this uh, a, a while ago on my channel. There was one point when I was in high school, I drew a character with just three fingers. And my art teacher, he, he said that he really liked the image. And I said, I'm really enjoying about the whole process is that I decided that this alien character has only three fingers. And he said, well, unless you put special attention towards it, no one's ever going to notice. The eye just immediately assumes five fingers unless you bring attention to it. So sometimes you can kind of fudge uh, pers like perspective related things and people will just accept it and such like that. Now, I wanted my lines to be really accurate uh, within, you know, a set distance away from the lighting that happens to be adorning the armor on the snake. And so, you know, the easiest way to do that was to use the spline. And to be honest, I didn't even think that I would wind up using the spline hardly at all while using this image. But the spline assistant was invaluable at this point in order to make a really good effect here. Now, since there's lighting coming out of these cracks in the armor, I thought, okay, well, the, the, the face that happens to be butted up right next to the lighting needs to have its own value that's a little bit brighter, but not as bright as the lighting itself. And so what I did is I created another layer and then put it underneath the the layer that I created for the actual lighting. Eventually I wound up merging these and such like that, and it wound up being part of the snake layer. But eventually I also wound up having a dedicated layer for the lighting. And the reason for that is because I wanted to have a gradient map applied directly towards the lighting. Now I used a very strong near white gray color. Now you don't ever want to use true black or a true white inside of your grayscale images, especially if you're planning on uh, coloring them later on 
down the line with, you know, blending modes and such like that. And, and the reason why I say you don't want to get too crazy with using 100% black or 100% white is because 100% white will not be influenced by values very much. And 100% black is going to make things a little bit too overly saturated and weird, uh, I believe. And so, you know, just keeping things just within a region away from the blackest black is going to save the day in the end. And there are little parts of this image that go really, really close to true black. Uh, and there's only one thing that gets really, really close to true white. And that is the laser beam coming from the warrior mouse. And I wind up using that value with all of the lighting inside of the scene. Now, I use the airbrush in order to basically apply the lighting for the most part everywhere. And that right there, it's going to apply it in variation the this super bright white like look look at the value on the color wheel just look at the value of white while i'm applying the lighting it just see how close it is to true white but it's not true white now whenever you're applying light like light is hitting a character or something like that usually there's this little bloom of light around the region that it hits. It's not just that there's light that's on the surface of the character. There's a bloom of light around. It's almost like a halo effect. And the, it creates this really nice immersive sort of atmosphere to everything. Now I think you want to be a little careful with that because it is possible that you could just make it look like they're in some surreal environment but just by creating a halo all around the person but the thing is is that all of the lighting is coming from behind the snake behind the warrior mouse and so this influences how everything is going to look and so I, I wound up actually creating a lot of somewhat of a halo or aura around these characters but I, I really hope that I didn't overplay it and that that is a concern for me now I'm really happy with how things are coming together at this point I'm still not a hundred percent sure how everything is going to look in the end but I I'm starting to feel a lot more confident about how things are are going to look and in fact inside of the background since everything is starting to look really cell shaded like how I mentioned in the previous video uh, I was really concerned about that and now I'm thinking hey you know what I could probably just apply a curves mask onto the background and then just erase portions of that with the mask and the soft brush and I think that would really be able to bring out some of the gradients that I wanted from the very beginning. So that's what I'm currently strategizing for the next video. And I'm, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get into actually coloring the image, colorizing it, but I'm not 100% on that. We're just going to have to see how things turn out. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the subscriber drawing request series really quickly here. Okay, so I, I've started to get a few compliments about the subscriber drawing request series, and I've stated a few times already that I've been thinking about canceling this series because it's starting to get really difficult to actually get drawing suggestions. I keep asking for drawing suggestions, and it seems like uh, the only time that I get them is right when I finish a subscriber drawing request and then I basically even in those situations I have to actually directly ask anybody who's commenting in the video and last time around I also had to go on to Twitter and just keep asking make sure to leave suggestions make sure to leave suggestions make sure to leave suggestions I tweeted probably about four or five times and then I got one suggestion that was kind of off the wall and it wasn't one that I wound up using and so as a result I've come to the conclusion that previous drawing suggestions are still valid which is a rule that I didn't even want to really have apply I wanted 
there to be a, a situation where older suggestions could expire and we could just focus on, you know, the new stuff. Like, what what are we doing now? And instead, you know, I'm having to think about, oh, well, you know, uh, I, I need to work with whatever drawing suggestions have been made. And, you know, I thought that this series would actually wind up getting a lot more attention in the sense of, hey, yeah, I want you to draw this, I want you to draw that, you know, drawing suggestions. Because every time that I tell people that I can draw, and they're like, oh yeah, let me take a look at some of your images. And then I show them, they're like, hey dude, can you draw this for me? And unfailingly, I say no. So I'm giving you guys a situation here, like a, a specific thing that I don't give anyone in my personal life. I never draw things for somebody else. Every time people ask me that, I either say, no, or how much are you going to pay me? You know, it, it it's kind of depressing to get into this situation where I'm giving you guys a little bit of a privilege here that I don't give anyone, and I just, I'm stuck here wondering, well, is anyone going to leave a drawing suggestion? Now, I understand you guys aren't obligated to give me drawing suggestions or anything like that, and, you know, I don't necessarily have to continue the drawing request series. It's fine. But, you know, I, I kind of like the series, and, you know, I'm getting compliments about it. So make sure, instead of the drawing request series, make sure that, you know, you're leaving drawing suggestions. And make sure that if you have a new idea, hey, yeah, you, you leave as many drawing suggestions as you want. Go on to Twitter and message me. Hey, yeah, leave the hashtag, hashtag SDR, and address me at OrphanLast, and... Here's a drawing request. Wouldn't it be cool if you drew this image? And you can get as specific as you want or as general as you want with your description and such like that. And that's fine. You don't have to be super specific or super general. You can be pretty specific. You can even say, hey, I want an orc and I want him on a hillside and I want like this big slew of like this army behind him or something. And billows of smoke uh, off in the distance and such. That's fine. You can give me drawing suggestions like that. Hell, you guys can go ahead and send me a photo on Twitter and say, hey, I want a picture like this and this and this and this and I want it instead of having this stuff, I want it to have all this other crazy stuff. Or, hey, I drew this picture. Can you improve it? Or anything. You guys can do anything. Like, suggest anything. And I'll see what I can do. Your presentation during the subscriber drawing request, if your presentation for what you request, if it's cool, then guess what? It's probably going to be in the poll. I mean, this series is supposed to be dramatically different from Draw With Jazza's channel. Draw With Jazza does things where he opens up his personalized app and it gives him a bunch of random words and he goes ahead and generally interprets it. Or he just assigns some random challenge to himself. No, you guys, you guys get to pick it. You guys get to be as specific or as general as possible. As long as it's not copywritten or you wanting me to draw your girlfriend or your family photo or something along those lines. And as long as it's not something stupid. It's just something that'll make someone laugh. I I don't use my sense of humor when I draw, so that that sort of thing doesn't interest me. And yet so many of the suggestions seem so very, very similar to what you would expect Draw with Jazza to do. So let, let's try to broaden it up a little bit. And You can leave as many drawing suggestions as you want. You can leave 20 of them with me. I don't care. Anyways, guys, that pretty much concludes it for this video. If you guys enjoyed it, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you didn't like it, please like, share, and subscribe. Anyways, there's a lot of work that goes into making these videos. And if you guys would like to take a look at any of my other videos, feel free to click on any of them that are appearing on the screen right now. Thank you very much for your time.